Grab your Bible, grab your notepad, something to write with if you got it. We have plenty of pens, plenty of things to write with. Now, last week I put out, while you're doing it, I put out what's called a mind-blowing truth. Do you remember that? And that in Genesis chapter 5, the 10 names that God gives in, in Genesis chapter 5 all tell the story of Jesus. How many here didn't get a copy of that? If you do, there's a copy for you to slide into your Bible. We'll see that you went at the end of the service, okay? But for example, Genesis chapter 5 talks about Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Malibu, <laughs> Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. And all of those names listed, this is how God is so perfect in his love towards you, mean. Mankind was appointed mortal and death and frail, sorrowing, but the blessed God came down teaching about his death, and then brings the despairing, you and I, comfort and rest. Right there in those names. So don't tell me that there's error in the Bible, because if you can find it, there's a huge reward for you. But nobody's found it since 1918. So keep looking. All right. You ready to get in the Word? I didn't hear enough amens. You got to amen the pastor, because that encourages me to share with you. All right, we've been doing a series called The Truth About. Amen. So this is the truth about the resurrection. Now, I must say, before we get started and I introduce this to you, is there are many teachings about the resurrection, about so many things that Jesus did. I didn't want to repeat another Sunday service that you might have heard it said a different way. I wanted to give you something that God gave me permission to give you, that is something maybe you didn't hear before, that will kind of make your involvement with Christ and this resurrection day more interesting and full of good things. Can you say amen? amen. All right. So good morning, church. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Many all over the world are celebrating the resurrection. If Jesus wasn't that important, why is everybody all over the world on this day celebrating? Right? So don't let the world say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. Jesus changed the world and will continue to change it if the people of the world stop ignoring him. Moving right along. <laughs> Amen. Are you with me? All right. So Jesus became the very last sacrifice for you. And he was guilty. Okay, because of our sin, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was made to carry his cross to his own death, and he did it for you. Aren't you glad? Now, scarcely would somebody die for another, and scarcely even for a friend would one die. But Jesus laid down his life for you and I. Think about it. You might be a parent, and then somebody captured and kidnapped your child and went and pulled them away, far, far away, and hid them from you. Wouldn't you want somebody to go rescue them? Yeah. Well, God the Father lost his children to the lives of Satan through Adam and Eve. And how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to come where we are and to set up a rescue system. Not only to rescue us, but it to involve you and I in the rescue program. Didn't he say, you go out into all the world and preach the gospel? So you're involved in the rescue program. Your job is not to get somebody saved. Your job is to tell them how much God loves them and how much God set them up to be saved. You see, not everybody chooses to be saved, do they? When I teach on healing schools... We know that not everybody gets healed, but God wants everybody healed. We know that God wants everybody saved. Do you believe that? But does everybody get saved? No, it has to do with your choice. What choice are you going to make? You're going to make God? Or are you going to be your choice? You're going to choose to do your thing. And so we just leave that alone. So, but I want to tell you, God has allowed me to share these truths with you. And maybe you've heard them before, but I want to share some. There are seven things that Jesus said on the cross before he died. Do you know why he said them? 
And when, did, when Jesus did give up the ghost, did you know his body was taken and placed into the tomb? But where did his spirit and soul go? Remember, man is a spirit, has a soul, your intellect, and lives in a body. We call it a nurse suit. Pinch your earth suit a little bit. You're wearing an earth. This isn't the real you. This is your earth suit. So make it look good. Make it smell good. Amen. Don't let it offend anybody. And that, that little earth suit is supposed to serve you. Say amen. But the earth suit doesn't tell you what to do. So I want you to get this now. Christ is God. Can you say amen? We have a problem. But here Jesus Christ came to where we were at, and now he's going to die on the cross. So the first situation I want to just put out in front of you is can God die? He cannot. So now we know the mystery of why Jesus came and became a man. For the one purpose only, to show the world what the Father was, by being like him, and to take our sin, our guilt, and our sicknesses upon his body on the cross. Now, it's interesting. If God can't die, we're going to see Jesus say a whole bunch of things, and I'll give you the understanding. So it's no longer a mystery to you that all that he went through, the intense, the, the, the immense situation and every step he went through for our freedom. And it's a travesty for somebody not to accept what he did. But because he did it for you. Can you say amen? So if God can't die. Now we know that Jesus had to be born of the flesh. He had to have a body given him. He wasn't God. A physical human body without sin was given Jesus. He had to sit nine months in his mother's womb. Be raised by Joseph and Mary. And then Joseph dies early. That's why you don't see him anymore. Why, G why Mary's standing at the cross, but there's no papa. There's no physical papa. Joseph died. And if you read the historical things, of course, I did it for you, so you don't have to, but you can. So here we have Jesus, who's God, in a human body. Listen to this. For the purpose of taking your sin. So God had to be clothed with a human body. So that he could carry our sin and our sickness. Because God can't die. But a human person anointed by God can. And that's why Jesus left his deity in heaven. And he came anointed by God. Yes, deity but without that deity power and came as a man, frail man, like sin, but without sin. And he had to walk through everything that was prophesied of him all the way up just to take our sins, sicknesses, guilt, and frustrations and lay it upon him and die for us. Now, aren't you thankful for that? That doesn't stop there. Jesus laid in that grave, his body, on the third day it rose. Can you say amen? But there was a lot of things Jesus did when they separated. So, let's look at the seven things that Jesus said. Can you say amen? All right, so before you go, before I give you these seven things, I want to also pick up something. I want to say this to you. Do you remember the story about uh, Moses going to see Pharaoh? And Moses had his what is his nephew or whatever, he had Aaron with him. Aaron had a little stick, didn't he? What was it? It was a rod, right? And we see the story. You've seen the Ten Commandments. He throws down his staff, and it turns into a big serpent, right? Remember the story? And then the two sorcerers on Pharaoh's side, they throw down their staffs, and they become two snakes. 
And in the story, the big serpent of Aaron and God swallows up the two little serpents of the snakes of the sorcerers. And, and you go, why is that in there? Reason being is Jesus became sin. And he swallowed up the snakes and the serpent's power. And he took it upon him on Calvary and destroyed the works of the devil. And it says when the serpent is laid up in the wilderness and those that gazed on him were healed, it's all about Jesus when Jesus became sin for us. The father had to turn his back. Jesus had to go it alone and go somewhere into the realm of the supernatural, into the pit where Satan dwells and come face to face with the enemy once more. Remember, he faced the devil in the temptation, but now he's going to face in his spirit and his soul. He's going to go right down and get right into Satan's face and says, you've lost, pal. Now, most Christians don't even know that. Some that are taught, well, they do. But what I want to teach you is Jesus had to go down to the lower parts. He had to preach to the spirits. He had to tell the devil, it's over with, pal, and I'm going to lead captivity free. And when Jesus rose from the dead, no longer are we in a prison. This world has been broken open, and now we can ascend to heaven without being stopped. Because there was a time without the death and resurrection of Jesus, mankind couldn't leave this planet. They were held captive in Abraham's bosom. So I set it up so to go over these seven things. Can you say amen? So we know Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness or the righteousness of God because he lives in us. Can you say amen? What Jesus came, he showed the world about his father. Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He paid full price for us. In fact, a little bit more. How many here remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Remember, it says it was a certain man who went from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves. That's Adam. Okay. And a, and a, a priest came by. Looked at him and says, well, that can't do anything. And he went on by the other side. And a Levite came by and he says, well, I can't be do doing anything. Because the law can't help you when you've fallen. It can only tell you guilt. It takes faith in God can give you an answer. But it says, how many here remember the story of the Good Samaritan? It says there was a certain Samaritan who came to where he was and saw him bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and then set him in his own flock and led him to the innkeeper and says, take care of him. And when I come again, I will repay you. The Good Samaritan story is talking about how Jesus came to where we were, bound up our wounds, poured in oil and wine, made us his children, put us in his flock, took us into the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, the inn, and says to the innkeeper, innkeeper, you watch over my children. The Holy Spirit's the innkeeper until I come again. That's where we are. You see, if you don't study the word with the spirit of God, you're going to get some kind of religious thing. Oh, I know the good Samaritan only means to be good to your neighbor and they'll be good to you. <laughs> Amen. All right. So we can see that. So the term, it is finished. So let's go ahead and, and let's find out the seven things that Jesus said on the cross. I broke them down for you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to read them to you, but um, they're just laid out really, really pretty good. And so let's go ahead and go to Mark 15, please. Verse 23 to 28. In this, this is the prelude to what Jesus said. Mark 15, 20 feet to 28. Again, I mean, I could spend weeks on this, but every detail, every little thing had meaning. All right, so let's look at it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour... And they crucified him. And the inscription on the accusation above him was written, the king of the Jews. 
And, when they, and with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. You know the story. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, all that Jesus did is written in scripture, and he fulfilled everything. But these seven words are not addressed very much in any sermons that I've seen. So I said, God, and he says, I want you to share what they mean. So seven things. Did you know God says, my God, my God? Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? How many remember that? Did you know? He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's a second one. Third one is, to the thief, he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Do you know what it means? Fourthly, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Fifthly, the woman, behold your son. In other words, Mary, here I am. And John, behold your mother. What he was saying is, what's one of the commandments that you and I live long on the earth? Do you remember what that commandment was? Honor your father and mother that it may be well with you. That you may live a long life on the earth. In other words, if you're bratty and sassy to your mom and dad, it's going to shorten your life. So no wonder the devil tries to cause the sassy and the and the teenagers sometimes get what we call a rebellious bug. You know, I used to put my teenagers in a box and set them in the corner. <laughs> Hoping they'll come out one day. <laughs> Moving right along. Are you with me? So also he said, Father, behold, your mother, okay? And the sixth thing he says, I thirst. Jesus said, I thirst. It's about the time he's ready to give up and die. And the seventh thing he says, it is finished. So let's tell you what these mean, okay? When God, when Christ said, Father, why have you forsaken me? We're just going to keep it simple. Jesus at this time was receiving our sins, our guilt, and our sicknesses upon him on the cross. And the Father God cannot look at sin. That's why he sent Jesus. So we live for God in Christ. So the Father can enjoy us and we can enjoy the Father without any separation. So he says, God... Why have you forsaken me? In other words, Jesus was on, is on his own. He's got to leave the Father. He's got to leave everything. And he's got to go face the devil. And he's got to win the fight for you and I. So his father has now left him alone. And Jesus can feel the separation for the first time. And with our sins, the father had to turn his back. Why have you forsaken me? How many didn't know that? When Jesus became sin, the Father, who is absolutely pure and righteous, had to turn his back. But we know Jesus didn't stay sin. Can you say amen? The Bible says that Jesus was so contorted, so beat up, he looked like a piece of hamburger on a stick. Seriously, Josephus' writings. He's the historian of the day. He says he wasn't pretty and he wasn't comely. He looked like a piece of meat. Could you imagine Mary, the, heart, the earthly mother of Jesus, how she felt? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus became sin at this moment. He became the serpent, swallowed up the snakes. Two, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How many know that? That's a great statement. How many here know everything you're supposed to be doing at all times? Every day. So there is times we need forgiveness. Can you say amen? Because not necessarily do we know what we're doing. Sometimes people that preach Christ or represent Christ, they don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> That's why you don't follow man. You follow Jesus. Please. Eyes off the world. Eyes off other people. Eyes off yourself. Eyes on Jesus. He's the life preserver that you wrap around your life so God can yank you out of here. Amen. Hello. But people aren't doing it. Yeah. You're just so busy. You can't have a relationship with God right now, yet you want to get married. <laughs> Boy, I need money. I got I to gotta find that right job. Well, how's that relationship with God going? Because he'll give you one. 
And you know that person you want to marry? Make sure you're mature enough to handle it. That comes with being with God. I didn't get this way on my own. I sure tried. <laughs> it didn't work. All right, let's move on. Listen. So the next thing is, he said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. What was he saying? How many know there was two thieves, right? And one thief says, hey, you know, he's going to suffer like us. And the other thief says, hey, when you go into glory and go into paradise, remember me. Now, what does it take in the Old Testament to get saved? Faith. Just faith, right? When that thief says, I believe in you, Jesus, he was marked and saved. He's going to Abraham's bosom. Where's Jesus going? He's going to Abraham's bosom, going into paradise. Remember, nobody could go to heaven yet. They went into a holding chamber called Abraham's bosom. There's a story about it in the gospel. It, you know, it says it's a place of paradise, and yet they're waiting for the Messiah to come to liberate them. So when Jesus rose from the dead, there's nobody waiting to be liberated. Can you say amen? Except maybe you today. Are you still bound by habits? You still feel guilty. Are you walking in suspicion? These things can go away from you when you spend time with God. And all I'm about is to give you what I know and encourage you to spend time with God. And it's you and God, sweetheart. You can do it. But don't let others talk you out of all the good things God has for every one of you. You say, well, I'm unworthy. I, I, I've ruined half my life just doing... God is not concerned about that. He's concerned, will you warm up to him? He wants to be our friend. Let's go on. What was the next phrase? Listen, he, it, the next phrase was, woman, behold thy son, wasn't it? So he says, thief, you know, today you've been married. And then number four, father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Eyes up here, please. What was he saying? Can you kill God? So what was he giving back to God? He was giving back the anointing of the Spirit and the power of God's divine presence. Separated. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Okay? The very life you gave me, I give it back to you. The anointing is going back to you, Jesus, because I can't take the anointing into hell. I got to face the devil without any help. See, people don't realize Jesus faced the devil as a man, not as God. And as a man, he said, it's over. You killed me, an innocent man. And so the penalty is all your captives go free. Hi, captives. You're free. Did you know that Jesus went into hell? He had to go into hell. Sounds bad, doesn't it? But hey, the gospel's not for your head. It's for your heart. And you'll find out he had to go there to liberate us. All right, so Father, he says, look, I love this. And then he says, he's talking to Mary, and he says, woman, behold your son. He's on the cross, right? And he said to John, behold your mother. In other words, take care of my mom. I'll be back. Mom, you see how I am today? I'm going to be in three days. Something different. So when he was communicating all that to his, to his mom, and then John sitting next to him, and that John, take care of my mother, he was saying, just like Abraham said, I and the child are coming back. Hello? You see, Jesus didn't think he was going to lose. Satan did. He says that the prince of this world, Satan, had known the plan of God. He would have never crucified Jesus. But being the fool that he is, he went to kill Jesus because Jesus was his problem. Folks, I want to tell you, if Satan will, once you accept Jesus, he, he will try to snuff your relationship out with him, but just recognize what it is and just say, hey, buddy, you can't get saved and I am saved, so just how about that? And when the devil reminds you about your past, you tell him about his future. 
You see, you've got to learn to stand on the truth. Stop reasoning with the devil because if you're going to live here, your Christianity, you're going to lose every day because Satan can outsmart you on a dime. But God inside of you is so quick, so smart, he could even cause you to sleep and he'd smash the devil's head. Because the devil himself, I know I talk, oh, the devil, people don't want to even mention him. But the devil's afraid of one thing. He's afraid of God in you. So let God out once in a while. <laughs> so when the enemy comes to you, he sees Jesus. No, oh my, I think I'll just wait, you know, for a better opportune time. Are you with me? So the next phrase was, I thirst. You see, when you're dying, you, you begin with tremendously dehydration. Remember, he's going to pour out his blood. They're going to shove his spear into the side. You've all read all those things, okay? But he thirsts. But I'm going to tell you something that you don't realize. He's not thirsting for something to drink. He's thirsting for the resurrection of his glorified body and the family that he's going to get. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. Hebrews chapter 12. Oh, 10, sorry. Now, the last thing he said, it is what? What did he mean by that? Have you ever waxed your car and you got finished? Have you ever ate your dinner and mom says you're finished? When Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished, every requirement, every sin, every bit of guilt, everything that could be held against any human being or held against anyone, keeping them from experiencing a relationship with God, it was finished, it was wiped out, it was paid for, it was cleansed, and the only one who keeps reminding us of our fault is the devil and maybe some of your friends. <laughs> God forbid. You know, it's always best that, to keep your mouth shut and don't offer your opinion very much. Unless you are asked for it. I used to be so excited for Jesus. I used to invite myself in. <laughs> Not a good thing. All right. The guy had to get you laugh a little bit. So here we go. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus became sin. Father, forgive them. So there's no debt because God the Father could have just wiped everybody out in a matter of seconds. Forgive them, Father. Third thing, you're going to be with me in paradise. You might say, well, how did the people in the Old Testament get saved, Pastor Kerry? I hear Christians say, oh, through the blood sacrifices. No. Nope. How did they get saved? Oh, by following the law. No. Nope. How did they get saved? By believing in God. That was all that was required. Did you know God wants you to be aware that he's there and to acknowledge that he exists and already He's happy about you. Because the whole world's been programmed to deny there's a God. Everybody that denies there's a God, their whole life falls apart. You take God out of the schools, and people get to killing one another. You take God out of the government, it begins to fall apart. You take God out of a family, and it becomes a disruptible family. You take God out of an individual, and you'll backslide and become worse than you were when you got saved. So I guess God's not going to leave. We're just going to hang around with God. Now, folks, amen? Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So at that time, he's going to die. We're going to just stop right there. His body is going to be carried over into a tomb. We see the tomb. The tomb was empty after the third right day. But his spirit and soul went somewhere else. Okay? So let's look and find out where his spirit and soul went. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter um, 3, please. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. It says in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins... 
the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. What was he supposed to do? Bring us to? Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Who were the spirits in prison? Remember, the world was a prison at one time, and no one could come to see God. Huh? Abraham's bosom, paradise, was a prison. And they had water, they had food, they were all taken care of. They were waiting for somebody to break that prison. That prison was Satan's doing through Adam's sin. And when Jesus was there, he preached to the people in prison. So he sound maybe something like this. I'm making it up. Abraham, I'm here. Get ready, we're leaving. Moses, wake up, Moses. I know you've been working hard, but get over here. We're going to be leaving. Would you tell everybody in Abraham's bosom, thousands, maybe, maybe a million, because it was all those people who believed in God in the Old Testament. They're all down there. No, don't guess who's there and who's not. Just be happy they were. So Jesus says, hey, we're going to be leaving, guys. He says, I'm going to just make sure everybody knows in a little bit. I got to go confront the devil and tell him he's lost and then take the keys of death and hell and we're going. Could you imagine the cheers and the happiness in Abraham's bosom knowing that Jesus is going to be back in a moment? After he confronts the devil, we've seen that Carmen thing, remember? That was pretty good last week. Ten, nine. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, please. Verses 3, or excuse me, verse 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 4, 8 through 10 tells us where he went. It says, therefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captive. captive. What did he do? When Jesus rose from the dead, he took everybody out of Abraham's bosom. He took everybody out of paradise and led them free. Can you say amen? Now, if you read the account in Matthew, it says when Jesus was born from the dead and the people, some of them from paradise, was raised from the dead, it says some of the graves were open and some of the saints went down into the houses, probably relatives, and said, hey, I'm alive from the dead. Jesus has risen. How many didn't know that? That a bunch of graves were open when Jesus came out of the grave. And they came out too. He led captivity captive. And he turned right around to you and I and gave us supernatural gifts. And Satan will work hard to keep you from them. Every one of you have a, an ability to move Supernaturally. Now, I'm not talking about paranormal stuff. I'm talking about supernatural. How many people you know gets coins out of fish, walks on water? This is the God that's in your heart. Stop thinking naturally. Start thinking godliness. Start thinking, I have a relationship with Almighty God. This is resurrection day. He went to hell for me and liberated me. All right. I might as well put you all in a baseball game and let you have a hit a home run. You notice nobody goes quiet there unless you're on the opposite team. All right, let's go on. So Ephesians 4, look what it says. Therefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, he that ascended, what does it mean? But also that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. So it says right there that Jesus right, went right on to the lower parts of the earth. What did it say? As it was with Jonah, three days, three nights in the belly of a well, so it shall be for the Son of Man. Jesus had to go over there because he had to take the keys right out of the devil's hands. And says, look, you lost, jerk. Now, you go, well, if the devil lost, why do we see so many of his stuff going on? And why so many people being deceived? Because they're not turning to God. They're turning to human knowledge and colleges, 
You want to learn to hate your country? Just send your kid off to college. Amen. Professors there are communists. Hello? They teach an Marxists and teach anti-United States. By the way, this country is founded on Almighty God. Amen. Don't take God out of this country. I'll have to move. <laughs> Moving right along, please. Hebrews chapter 2, listen to this one, 14 and 15 says, Insomuch that as children have been partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Say, I'm on the winning team. And release those who through fear of death, listen, did you know a human being is afraid to die? Okay, I'm going to release you in just a minute. Okay? A human being is afraid to die. That's what Satan's put on him. But you know there's no death for a Christian? You die physically, but your spirit, the moment your body dies and you give up the last breath, for a Christian, your spirit steps right in front of God. Bing! Then, if they, hey, then if they want to revive you, you might have an argument. God, I don't want to go back. Many people have. So why have we ignored all the pure truths about what Jesus has done? Because there is a spiritual outlaw, a wonderful liar that has gone throughout our history lying and ruining lives from generation to generation. Your folks had a drinking problem, Satan's going to see you have a drinking problem. Your folks had a smoking problem, he's going to see you have a smoking problem. And then he brings up the dumb scripture which says, Well, the curse of the forefathers are being revisited upon. Listen, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. You tell that familiar spirit that made your dad drink, you're not going to have any part of that. And what made your mom smoke and killed her, you're not going to have any part of that. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the resurrected one's got you marked to go. How many here are going? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My home is laid up way beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. You see, I'm not camping here anymore. Hey, I'm not camping here. Oh, yeah, I got blessed with many, many things. But I'm so on the giving side of it because I don't want anything here to keep me from there. That would be an actually foolish thing. And finishing with you. So we see that Jesus went to hell, didn't he? Jesus went to hell, preached to his judgment upon the enemy. It says in John uh, the 16th chapter that the prince of this world is judged already. So whenever you start to agree with what he tells you to do, you're going to get a judgment on you, and you don't want that. So stop listening to what the enemy says. The enemy divides us. God unites us. The enemy tells you, don't listen to that crazy preacher up there. Who knows what he's all about? If you heard that, you know the devil's right in your head. I love that. First time I went to see some Christians that love God, I called them all of the devil. Look what happened to me. <laughs> Don't you do that, Linda. <laughs> I did. I went to an old Pentecostal meeting. They're all testifying. And I said, these people are weird. I went back, told my wife, I better all of the devil. And I was sick for two weeks because they wanted to snuff me. Guess what? After those two weeks, I went back to the same people and I got saved. Because they weren't of the devil. They were of God. And Satan was lying to me. How do you tell when the enemy's lying to you? It's when your life falls apart. When the decision you thought was good was bad. Hmm? When you hear your own voice speak in your head that says, eh, you don't have to believe in God. That is not you saying that. That's the enemy because he got access to your brain. He can't read your thoughts, but he has access to your brain. You know, just because you have birds flying over your head, don't let them make a nest in your head, in your hair. 
Why do you dwell on all the negative? <laughs> dwell on Jesus. He'll give you the answer. All right. So he went for our sins and our sicknesses. Thirdly, he crossed over it from paradise and then released them. Guys, we're going now. And he led captivity captive. And he says, when he led. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, many things happened. Number one, a new testament was instilled. Forty days after the resurrection of Jesus, the day of Pentecost came, and the Spirit entered the earth like never before. There, the Holy Spirit is in every molecule you breathe. Well, how come I don't receive nothing? Because your mind's not on God, it's on you. As soon as you put your mind on God and you start, oh, Lord, I worship you. And your head says, look how dumb you look. And, oh, I worship you. Next thing you know, you're breathing in, breathing out God. And God is loving on you and ministering to you. And all of a sudden, you can get healed. You can get released. I went to church. I, I never felt so good in my life. Well, come back. Don't let a scary man like me scare you. All right, I'm finishing. Raised with him by faith we are. So say, I was a sinner, but now I made peace with God. Now I'm a child of the almighty God. Now, so let me explain this, and, and then we'll call it a day for you, okay? Because I know you got to get there, do the dinner. you got the family coming over and all that, which is great, Okay? You got to understand, okay? You have to understand. God just wants to become your savior and your friend. All the lies, all the religious people. Religion is not what God designed. Religious people killed Jesus because he didn't fit in. Look at you. You don't fit in. And God loves you. You see, God wants us to just acknowledge him and to talk with him and he will transform us into who we were supposed to be before the enemy lied and turned us into some kind of mess. Every one of you have had a rough time. Even the little ones have not had all good. So therefore, let's get with Jesus. Let's have him teach us how to walk, how to live. Believe me, you'll have the time of your life. It's not boring. People say, oh, I get saved. You know, I got to give up this. I have to give up my friends. I got to give up this. Let me tell you, you get saved, they'll give you up because they're phonies. They don't really love you for you because they will want the best for you. And if you accept God as your Savior, they're going to be happy for you. And if they're not your real friend, then they're going to work because of the devil's lies to keep you from coming to church and from loving the Lord. That you should recognize. God draws people to him. Satan scatters people and turns people against one another. You want to know why this person's against that person? That person's against that part? That's what Satan does. But Jesus said, a house divided will fall, but if you unite the house, we'll stand. Folks, we only have one enemy out there, and he doesn't like any of us. So rather than fight with your brothers and sisters or races of people, China, this and that, and black and white, and all that stupid stuff, let's love God and teach, have him teach us how to be effective so more people can come with us because we are leaving. And I want to tell you, it's not very long from now. You can see it everywhere. So don't ignore it. Okay? All right. You're here. You're here because either you were invited or God wants you here. So let's make sure you're saved. Everybody pray with me. You ready? Okay. Let's see how fidgety we get. All right. Just simply say, Father God, this, this Jesus, I know he's real. You need to prove to me I need him. This is okay. Listen to me. You need to prove to me. Will you prove to me that Jesus loves me and he cares? I accept it by faith, but would you walk with me and show me things that I need to know that will help me, Lord? I believe that you'll do that in Jesus' name. And the reason why I led you that way, instead of feeling guilty and praying a prayer of sin, 
is I asked God, I said, everybody keeps telling me that you're real. And I kind of think you are, but would you show me? That's all I prayed. And you know what he did? He showed me. So just open up. Just allow God to minister to you. Stop running your life. It isn't coming out all that good. Surrender and say, God, how can I do it better? And he will walk you through it. He will teach you about everything. I don't know about you, but I get excited about it. Amen. 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 Well, if you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord praise? <laughs>